welcome to the, um, our artist talk. Uh, for those of you who are planning on being here uh, last week, um, thanks for coming this week. Appreciate that. Um, it's hard to compete with sunshine, so I also appreciate you being here on a beautiful day. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie as the Santos tonight. Um, she's put an incredible amount of time into her talk, um, and I'm very excited to see where she goes with this piece. Uh, to introduce Stephanie, she's a queer Guatemalan American poet, writer, and mystic from our city of Portland. She earned an MFA in poetry at Columbia University School of the Arts and a BA in English at Stanford University. She is the founder of Terra Obscura and Ovo de la Selva Press. She teaches poetry at the Independent, Resource, Independent Publishing Resource Center and Literary Arts and was the recipient of the 2016 Art of Literary Arts Fellowship. Her new full-length poetry collection, The Swarm Queen's Crown, was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. She is also the author of several, several chapbooks, and her work has appeared in many print and online journals and magazines, including Pornica, The Boston Review, Orion Magazine, Nailed, and Noble Gas A ritualized production of Stephanie Gray her work is rooted in the crossroads of virtual, ancestry, identity, and environment, invoking history as a knowledge that can be felt, something with the potential to transform and transform our perspectives at the intersections of language and image, intimacy and violence, and grief and galvanization. Please help me welcome this. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Um, do you want to sit down? Or go for it. There's three chairs. <laughs> um, uh, hello, everyone. I know most of you, so it feels a little formal, but um, that's OK. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks to Betsy and the Art Museum and everybody who's helping today. This is a really cool program. It, the Artist Talks program invites artists to pick any piece in the museum and spend months with it in a really open-ended way, um, forming a relationship with it, uh, creative, emotional, and just seeing what comes of that. And then we get to share what happened or what we thought about. So it's been a really wonderful adventure for me um, from the very beginning because this sort of open-ended mo mode is so organic to my creative process, be it poetry or otherwise. The way it usually works is something captures my attention, um, be it a painting, a dream, a memory, an object, an encounter, um, and then it starts to project itself in the world around me uh, in the same way that if you hear the word elephant and that's lodged in your mind, you start to see elephants everywhere. So I start seeing the thing in places all around me and the tendrils of it kind of form a net and start catching things. And that pattern kind of starts to cohere different things that I normally wouldn't associate with each other. So it's a really associational process. And the poet Lucille Clifton, one of my favorites, said that um, the one thing poetry teaches us, if anything, is that everything is connected. And another poet, Wallace Stevens, said that poets are the priests of the invisible. So I rely a lot on this hidden connectivity of the world because it's where my faith is rooted and it's where everything creative for me comes from. And so I often don't know what I'm doing or what I'm trying to get at when I set out to do it. Um, I don't often have a clear idea of what I'm doing, but I usually have a really strong intuition of some kind of ineffable path or instinct that's guiding me toward whatever it is I'm supposed to find. So sometimes in my creative process, I feel that I completely dissociate and become blind and work in this sort of slow, blind fury process that 
is more about channeling something unknown, either within me or from outside of me, more so than kind of creating something with really conscious meaning. And only later do I really realize what I was actually doing. Um, and Carl Jung said that the sea is the favorite symbol of the unconscious, the mother of all that lives. And so it's a wonderful subject just to stir all of those hidden waters of the mind. As we interact creatively with a piece of art, um, in particular, when we translate some, our experience with that art piece into language, it's called ekphrasis, which is a Greek term that means to speak out and to give voice to something that would otherwise be mute. So there's a whole genre of poetry that's called ekphrastic poetry. Um, in which the, the poet speaks to or of or about a piece of art. But at its most basic, ekphrasis is just a description of what you see. So before I talk about this piece here, each of you should have a notebook. Is that true? Okay. We'll pass out some notebooks and pencils. And I want you to just observe. So check out the painting here. Um, just look at it for a little bit. And then I'm gonna give you just a few minutes to jot down what you see, a description. That, that doesn't have to be poetry, it doesn't have to be elegant or fancy language. Just take a few minutes to try to be honest about what you're actually looking at. What are, what are you noticing about the piece? Um, so just let's do that now, just take a few minutes watch the piece and then spend a few seconds, a few minutes just writing a few sentences about it. So next, I'm just going to have you turn toward the person nearest you, or wh whether that's two or three of you, whatever is most convenient, so that everybody has someone to share with. And I just want you to exchange your description, like read your descriptions to each other. Um, and as you listen to each other's descriptions, pay attention to what's different. What, what are the differences between your descriptions? Would a few of you mind sharing um, either what your description was or if you, what you noticed about the differences between your and your partner's um, descriptions? Yeah. Um, one thing I saw that Karen didn't, Karen didn't see was like the sun. I noticed that like 
for me, I saw that you could see there's sunlight, but you don't see the sun. It's like trying to shine through, but it's really cloudy. Um, for me, I, I saw an endless adventure. I describe how it's possibly a boat. I wish I was at boat, you know, and I can see as far. So you don't pass limitations for me. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. I, I didn't, we didn't ask each other our names, but um, this evoked a memory of hers that she hadn't thought of for about 10 years. And, um, and I thought that was interesting. And I just observed what I saw. So I thought what that difference was cool. Um, well, I saw swelling rolling waters with wind and sunlight across the water, maybe a sailboat on the horizon and somewhat stormy clouds. That's all I had time to write. That's kind of what I saw. Cheers. My questions are, is that the shadow or clouds on the top of the, of the painting? Yeah. Are they shadows? Those are clouds. OK. The other question is, which direction is the boat going? And the third question is, where are we standing? Are we on another boat? I saw an accumulation, like the water, I was thinking of the, trying to describe the color, I was thinking that it's like layers of jade and that the, the clouds are seem to be like accumulations and layers of clouds. I wasn't even thinking about being on a boat. To me, I was in, I'm inside of the water, <laughs> like looking up. And yeah, and I love how, yeah, the source of light is obscured, but you can see it filtering out, yeah. Okay, um, what did, to me, it was an, an inspiration, um, and this is what I, it came out of me when I saw the picture. Um, distance, distant wandering of the soul, a cradling, cradling of the waters, the immensity. That's what it came to my mind. Thank you. I'm sure if we were to look at every single person's thoughts and descriptions, um, though some ideas might overlap, they would all be completely different because we all look out of different beings, um, different worlds. But um, that's the one, that's just the wonderful thing about art, you know, is how it, it stirs things in us. It stirs something to respond. It, it creates notions, feelings, ideas. So back on the, my first day at the museum when I was not sure what piece I would talk about and I was wandering around searching, um, I, I just had all these thoughts and things f kind of flowing through my brain and there's all this kind of chatter inside of me. And I started to think about the idea of ekphrastic thinking, you know, rather than an ekphrastic poem or some kind of finished product, I thought about a mode of thought that's ekphrastic, a, a mode of thought that's responding um, to art, to work, and creating a sort of art in its moment, you know, thought for thought's sake, feeling for feeling's sake. And it seemed that, that like there was something valuable in that and simply listening to my own ekphrastic thoughts and sensations and just letting them pass through. But eventually I, I came through the exhibit and um, I stood at this doorway here and I kind of just scanned the room and immediately this piece just spoke to me. It had like this magnetic force and I just felt like I floated toward it. It had an uncanny power about it. 
So I just, I came right to it. I don't even think I looked at other paintings in this room. But what struck me was, I mean, just looking at it, at the composition in a really abstract way, that sort of monumental light and dark, the way the painting sort of bisected there, um, the elemental power of that, you know, sky and sea, water and air, and of course it's incredible realism how the light just seems so palpable, you can see it sort of bouncing over the waves, um, and how the, the, the water seems so alive, like it's caught in motion, like there's some kind of spell of stillness over the painting. And so it really enchanted me, and that word enchantment kind of was floating in my, in my mind. And also this magnificent Baroque gold frame, which just sort of exalts it further and creates a sort of sacred glow around the whole scene. Um, and can also feel like a window pane, you know, something like it's a threshold. So I, all that chatter I talked about, you know, walking through the museum and hearing my own thoughts about all these other paintings, I kind of went really still when I saw this and it was just silent. And I felt this haunted sense, um, a sense of mortality even. I didn't have these words for it yet, this is just looking back, but I felt something like the frailty of human life beginning, like some notions about that beginning to stir. And just thinking of that, you know, the frailty of human life against these sort of vast elemental powers. Um, and, and within that drama, the enduring mystery of the elements. So when I look at this piece, I get this strong feeling that my gaze in looking is being transported out of this room, um, that I'm really looking through the painting to another place, and that there really is a sea out there, and that there's something really durable and true about what I'm looking at, that the motions are real, and that it's a moving piece, it's a spellbound piece. So I just wanna play a little video for you on the subject of enchanted paintings. That's from the Narnia franchise. Let's see. Lucy, have you seen this ship before? Yes. It's very Narnian looking, isn't it? Yeah. Well, just another reminder that we're here and not there. There once were two orphans who wasted their time believing in Narnian nursery rhyme. Not so fascinating about that picture anyway. It's hideous. Edmund, it looks like the water's actually moving. What rubbish, see? That's what happens when you read all those fanciful novels and fairy tales of yours. Edmund, the painting! <laughs> oh, the smash the wrong thing! No, Lisa, no! Help me! Let go! <laughs> oh, no. oh. It was fast, but that's all we need to see. But th that was what, um, that was, I'll just, I'll just leave it like that. That was the sense I got. That was the magic I was feeling when I was looking at this. That kind of sense that this was a magic painting and it brought back those childhood memories of ma other magic paintings I had heard about. And I thought the first, actually the first, painting I associated with that kind of magic is from the movie Witches, which was a Roald Dahl book first. And in one of the scenes, one of the witches banishes a little girl to a painting, and she grows old in the painting and eventually disappears. And it was just such a haunting thing. I just, my whole life, that scene from the movie really haunted me, this idea of living and dying in a painting. But I love that, um, 
that little Narnia scene, you know, of the, the water coming out, because that's how I feel about this. Like, it, it, we're just right there at, at the threshold of something. Um, at the threshold of this reality and another reality. So the title of this painting is Marine, and it was painted in oil in 1884 by William Trost Richards. He was born on November 14th, 1833, in Philadelphia, and he was described by a close friend as being very small and frail and modest, nearly shy, um, who had the quiet laughter, but he also had this great intensity of mind. He was someone who could speak for hours about the, the subjects that he loved, um, and he was very well educated, and he knew about a wide range of subjects, and he specifically loved poetry, and that was one of his favorite things to talk about. And his friends said he would often recite Wordsworth from memory. Um, in particular, he loved this collection of sonnets about the river Duddon. And I'll, I'll just share with you a little excerpt from one of the sonnets that reflects on the enduring and transformative power of that river. I see what was and is and will abide. Still glides the stream and shall forever glide. The form remains, the function never dies. While we, the brave and mighty and the wise, we who mourn in our youth, defied the elements, must vanish. And if, as toward the silent tomb we go, through love, through hope, and faith's transcendent dower, we feel that we are greater than we know. So even though those words are about a river, they might as well be written about the sea, which is the alpha and omega of all water, including all rivers. Um, but the form remains, the function never dies, while we must vanish. In those lines, we can hear the sort of bewildering and restless immortality of the sea pitched against our human frailty. And yet, Wordsworth reminds us of faith's transcendent dower, hinting towards something greater than we know. So in the sonnet, the greatest truth and possibility of our own being takes shape kind of against the enduring form of the element. The element has the power to turn back our gaze, um, not only to, upon ourselves, but past and through ourselves to envision ourselves through the unimaginable, through death even, to the possibilities beyond. So this brings up notions of death and transformation. The sense of death is a door to a higher state of being, um, which are scorpionic themes. <laughs> and as, uh, at the time William Richards was alive, um, which was smack in the middle of the Victorian period, spiritualism and astrology were extremely popular in the culture. And whether or not William Richards ascribed to astrology, he, he certainly probably heard about it and knew about it, but in fact, he was born under the constellation of Scorpio. So I'll, I wanna read you a little bit about um, Scorpio from actually the first reference book I ever bought for myself. I was 15 in high school and I bought um, the Penguin Dictionary of Symbols, which is a wonderful book. Scorpio is the eighth sign of the zodiac, midway through the three-month period of autumn when the gales blow the yellowing leaves away and animals and trees prepare for a fresh existence. Scorpio has Mars for its ruler and is a symbol simultaneously of resistance, of fermentation and of death, of dynamism, endurance, and struggle a dialectic of destruction and creation, of death and resurrection. And the sign of Scorpio is associated with the element of water and is the only sign of the zodiac that is associated with three or four different animals, the scorpion, the snake, the eagle, um, or the phoenix. 
Now, the eagle is the enemy of the snake. In the high, it's the high divine creature that consumes and destroys the lowly snake, and thus the snake is resurrected into the divine body of the eagle. And the cycle of death is also embodied in the eagle's mythological corollary, which is the phoenix, a bird which is said to have lived for 500 years and then built its own funeral nest from aromatic twigs um, in which it burned from the heat of its own body and later emerged fully resurrected. So the themes of Scorpio and its element of water fit very naturally to the sea. And I'll read you a little piece from that same book of symbols about the sea. In sum, the sea is a symbol of the dynamism of life. Everything comes from the sea and everything returns to it. It is a place of birth, transformation, and rebirth, an image simultaneously of death and life. So knowing that William uh, Richards devoted a large portion of his life to painting the sea with exquisite attention to its movements and, its, and um, the details of light, he, such that he became known as a marine painter, even though he painted every other landscape there was to paint. Um, I can, can't help but think something about his scorpionic nature led him toward these themes. Um, most of his paintings, actually are from the shore, the perspective is from the shore, and you see the waves crashing, you see like the shuddering, you know, breaking, dr the drama of the waves against the shore, and that really creative, destructive force, all, but, all with the same kind of realism that's so full of life and full of the invisible. And one of his letters he wrote, this really beautiful line, all the saddest and wildest noises are reproduced by the surf. He was really precocious from a young age. When he was 13, he left school and he started to work as a draftsman for a lamp and chandelier company. And, and he would kind of make, draw designs, these really detailed, precise designs. So if you can imagine that he could already do that when he was 13, um, what kind of natural talent he must have had. And then by 17, he was studying under this kind of local famous painter um, who had come from Germany and became his sort of honorary pupil apprentice. So there's an anecdote about William from a, from a friend um, that about that age, when he was 17 or so, that he spent an entire summer painting a single blackberry bush and um, meanwhile, this other painter next to him, you know, painted the same thing in, in, you know, two hours or something. But it was really that seeing and observing uh, were crucial parts of, of uh, William's process, that that was as crucial a movement as the movement of the brush or the movement of the pencil. And another thing is about his realism. It never feels neutral or cold. You know, he could capture these extreme details with such precision and yet without losing the spirit of the whole, the spirit of what he was seeing. So he was a kind of acolyte to nature. He was really devoted to it and he was a particular kind of seer, right? One who didn't look into the past or the future, but who looked really deeply into the present and into the, into the light, how the light touches each thing. He looked for the truth in what he saw, for the truth in color, the truth in form, truth in observation. And these were all ideas um, articulated by this prominent Victorian art critic and thinker, John Ruskin, who said, paint the leaves as they grow. If you can paint one leaf, you can paint the world. The great artist sees farther and more deeply and makes the spectator a sharer in his own strong feelings and quick thoughts. 
and leaves, leaves him instructed under the sense of having held communion with a new mind, of having been endowed with the keen perception and the impetuous emotions of a penetrating intelligence. Um, which is why I think when I look at this painting, it's like I'm looking through somebody else's eyes as well. There's that sort of uncanny transference where we are looking through William's eyes, we're seeing what he saw. Um, and he transports us there. These are not neutral scenes, they're alive. So Richard also wrote to, Richard's wrote to one of his daughters who was learning to draw. Um, when a tree grows in an open space in perfect freedom, we may say it is a fine tree, but we never think of it as picturesque, of having had any experience. These are never selected for pictures, only those that are twisted and curved and give evidence of a fight for their lives. So he had this kind of abiding interest in uh, the central struggle of our lives and our mortality. And those are well reflected in the themes of nature and come through the drama of all his work. But his underlying gift was his profound observation combined with an openness to the underlying mythic energies of our experience in the natural world. The craft of observation starts really small, learning to see the details, learning to see what you see and then translating it into color and shape. For me, in my poetic world, this looking doesn't always translate to sight because I'm not working with a visual medium. So sometimes I'm looking at in other directions, in other places. I'm looking at what's inside, what's being felt, what's invisible, what are the colors and shapes of our experience in a moment, um, in a memory, in a dream. Those are the things I'm communing with. So when I first saw this painting and I told you I floated toward it, uh, I saw this little shape over here. And growing up in Oregon, we're very used to seeing, you know, the sea stacks, like haystack rock. And so just immediately that was my first impression of it, that it was a rock. It was one of those, like a haystack rock out there in the distance. Um, but upon coming nearer, I saw that it was a ship and with its sails up. And so those thoughts started to, to stir, those notions, ship, stone, ship, stone, and the connections of those and all the other things I talked about, these feelings of mortality, all kind of blending together and forming, you know, kind of informing each other. Um, so I, uh, oh, the other thing is, um, well, I'll talk about that later, but I'll, I'll read this poem I wrote. It's called Mid-Ocean, which is actually the title of this other piece he did over here. It's a similar composition and it was painted within a few years of this one. The only difference is the sea is more rugged and the, the ship is closer and, and kind of turning on its side a bit. Mid-Ocean. There's a little mist which from a distance to one coming slowly from across the room has the look of rock stacked and lone against the sky and the sea muttering at its half-drowned waist. In some places, the waves peel away from their shadows and you see for just a moment the blue rose windows tucked beneath their peaks. And in others, the darkness heaves and throws the little light back up. Somewhere outside of all this, a gold frame promises to hold you, just as you are at the threshold of the elements. But now you stand in front of it and see that in the crease of all that sky and water, it is not a stone, in fact, but a ship, with her sails up like a moth quietly resting at the edge of some lamp. You look away and the thing returns to a neutral smudge. Now the foreground crumples and folds and the veiled waves usher as always their circles of disturbance. 
In private, in their language of crushing, they idly chat with the sky beyond, which to you looks mostly empty, except for the pale eye of fire afloat in the clouds. And there, there's a copy of this poem, too, for each of you in, on the back bench, I think. So one of the things I mention in the poem was the blue rose, light, rose windows tucked beneath the peaks of the waves. And it, once you have a chance to come up close, you'll see these little kind of brilliant light colored um, bits at the peaks of some of the waves. And for me, those were little gems. They just, they, they have this brilliance to them and they fascinated me and they also felt like little benedictions, you know, like there's a little um, sacred revelation to each one of those moments. And William called these moments miracles of color under the curving wave and he studied them for years for a lifetime actually he struggled with them it was something he talked about a lot his struggle with getting that color just right and he was someone who would look at the sea for hours literally three or four hours at a time just watching it staring at it to the point where you know his daughter said some people thought he was going insane but he would just watch it for hours um, he would take his shoes off and, and step into the surf and just stare at the sea, watching for hours to try to see those colors and those, the way the light worked. And in this time, too, um, it was more common that painters would paint at home in their studio, so they were memorizing. They were learning the light so that they could take a little sketch and go home and paint something like this. So he also knew that this struggle existed with him, that, he, that there was always something greater to paint, that he, there was a greater truth than his ability. And so that gave him something to strive for. There's always something more to see. There's always a more precise or more true way of seeing. So, during uh, his life was the Civil War, too. You know, uh, that was the 1860s. Um, well, I'll get back to that, thinking about just the kind of death in the air and these other larger themes. But he made many trips across the Atlantic in his life. And he took, it took in those years about two weeks to cross by steamship. And just imagine those crossings for someone like him to be surrounded by the ocean in all directions to feel its power and its swell underneath you um, and also sometimes to be really shook by it and frightened by it, to be in the awe, you know, to be in that little ship in the distance, which is an interesting perspective, right? Because, you know, someone mentioned maybe we're standing, where are we standing? Are we on another ship? And yet it's like we're, he's also looking at himself on that little sh farther ship. Um, so the Civil War, 1860s, um, and in addition to that, you know, over half, half a million people died. Um, and in the, near the end of the war, William uh, also lost two children of their, of their five. And so there was this really mournful time, and he spent this summer after the death of his children uh, at the sea, just watching it. And then after that, he took his wife and the two other, three other children, and they went to Europe. And on their return, there was a really bad storm, and the ship was scuttled, and they actually nearly died. Like, they were left out at sea for several days, and ice was coating the deck, and they all, we're looking at death. It was, it was that close to the edge. So it was said that that experience sort of solidified the sea as his subject. Um, and you can imagine everything that was in the air at the time, you know, the deaths of the Civil War, the deaths of his children, his own scorpionic nature, um, all of these things soaked into his body and then being in that extreme encounter with the sea. You can imagine what kind of extremely spiritual experience that must have been. So one of the 
the first things I noticed about this painting too, and the, one of the reasons I think it's so enchanting is that mid-ocean perspective. Um, and I, in my research, I found that most of his things were painted on shore, but there were a few others that seemed to share this perspective, this mid-ocean being one of them. And then this other one, which I'll show you. There we go. Um, so this, this piece here is titled differently than his other pieces. Most of them have a kind of more generic title or a specific place name. But this piece is called Old Ocean's Gray and Melancholy Waste. And that's a line taken from a poem by William Cullen Bryant. It was one of the most popular poems of the day, like everyone knew it. It was called Thanatopsis, that's the name of the poem. Um, Thanatopsis is another Greek term and it means a consideration of death. It comes from the two root words thanatos, death, and opsis, sight, so death sight. And the poem opens by discussing nature's ability to hold, reflect, and soothe all of our human moods and concerns from our joys to our fears of death. And uh, when death comes near, he says, you will hear in nature this still voice, which was an allusion to that small still voice of God. Go forth under the open sky and list to nature's teachings, while from all around earth and her waters and the depths of air comes a still voice. The poem discusses death as an inevitability, as a mysterious realm in which we merge with the elements, expressing a profound humility for the human form. Earth that nourished thee shall claim thy growth, to be resolved to earth again and lost each human trace. Surrendering up thy individual being, thou shalt go to mix forever with the elements to be a brother to the insensible rock and to the sluggish clod which the rude swain turns with his share and treads upon. The oak shall send his roots abroad and pierce thy mold. But he also goes on to say that in death, in that great tomb, we also lie beside kings and queens and seers of the past and future. The hills rock ribbed and ancient as the sun, the vales stretching in pensive quietness between, the venerable woods, rivers that move in majesty, the complaining brooks that make the oceans green, and poured round all old oceans gray and melancholy waste are but the solemn decorations of the great tomb of man. So something like 4.5 billion years ago, molten Earth began to cool and violent collisions with comets and asteroids brought about the creation of water, the ocean, the same enduring body of water that we owe all life on this planet to, and the same water we find in our bodies if we source it that far back, and that composes the greater part of us. It's the same sea that I'm sure every single person in this room has stared into and felt something stirred within you, has felt some profound you know, sense of what you are and what you are not and, and of your mortality. Um, I think we all share that reverence for the sea. And, um, and I love how, you know, in this painting, how that tiny ship can hold both thoughts of hope and the future, adventure, but also that kind of fleetingness, you know, how small it is, how fading it is out there in the elements. And the, the painting is especially compared to um, this and the other one we saw before, which are bleaker. There's a, there's a, still a calmness to the sea 
and yet you can see in, in these corners here the waves darkening and the storm cloud sort of over in this corner um, with that, a hint of that death that dwells there too. I think a lot about, uh, when I was watching this, or uh, thinking about this painting, I thought a lot about this one poem by Walt Whitman in which the little spider, like the ship, is casting out these threads which are like our souls. A noiseless, patient spider I marked where on the little promontory it stood isolated, marked how to explore the vacant, vast surrounding. It launched forth filament, filament, filament out of itself, ever unreeling them, ever tirelessly speeding them. And you, O oh my soul, where you stand, surrounded, detached, in measureless oceans of space, ceaselessly musing, venturing, throwing, seeking the spheres to connect them, till the bridge you will need be formed, till the ductile anchor hold, till the gossamer thread you fling, catch somewhere, O oh my soul. So I want to share a little bit more with you about um, just my own work that came out of this, these thoughts and these thinkings um, with the painting. And I, I thought a lot about Ginsburg's idea of notice what you notice, you know, and thinking about uh, uh, Richard Williams, his uh, intense observation. Um, and every time I came to the painting, I would just take note of, I would sit on one of those benches and just look at it or come up close and I would just take note of what I was thinking. What, was, what are the thoughts? What are the feelings? Even what stray thoughts did I have? And when, like for instance, his middle name, Trost, when, when I first was going home to research him, I kept forgetting William and Richards. It's like they would slip out of my mind and I would just remember Trost because it was an unusual word. It was different. And so I looked it up, I looked up the etymology, and out of the different meanings, there was one that was really interesting to me. It was uh, from medieval German, and it means, it, it's a name that would be given to a child as a nickname or a middle name, and it meant consolation or comfort to be bestowed on a child after the death of a sibling. So this idea that if a sibling dies, the next child would bear this consolation, like they, in a way, carry on the dead uh, spirit of their sibling. So that tied back into my thoughts of cyclicality and mortality um, and thinking about trust, you know, carrying this, this sort of, like, name with him. There's, let's see. Um, yeah, so, so then I want to read to you a little bit from the chat book. There's also a copy of this for all of you. So, so the, the chat book, it's, it's Marine, and it's called Marine, and I just wrote sort of some poems and some hybrid things. I don't know what to call them, but they, they just incorporate some of my thoughts, some of my musings on, on the different... Uh, notions that came out of this piece. I'll just read you a little excerpt. Th this one kind of stems from thinking about the name. I wanted the long name of the sea, but a name is a mythic construction, a telegraph of topaz and shadow crossed in the wires. A name is a flimsy but important gauze that winds about a being or lies like a thin carpet of pine needles spread over the carnal fire of a ritual, where later an eyeless presence will dance and hum with the geologic rigor of earthquakes. It is a base thing, seated and brimming, brown with its own deaths and desires, humming toward the concealed music of its bright red organ. Don't say... Don't ever say your name. As soon as I hear, I won't recognize any longer the animal swells and roars and what ebbs and what the night with the cat's episcopal shine forces and shapeless and lice bit as the thing we call the sea. 
the sea, the sea. I wanted the long name of the sea drawn black in the narrow archive of a page as dark and necessary as the by name of a child born after the death of a sibling, an inscription like a sigil forged in the mother's burning foundry of dusk and thick with the guttering milk of her loss. A syllable that burns to the back of the page and drips to the floor unuttered. Come close now to the mist that rises on the ugliest of days in the rose-soaked vapors of the garden before dawn. The rain is sometimes still whispering its secrets, having just traveled from the sea, having just slept in the dream of judgment and been pure, and so heard its name admitted in the sky. And I'll read a little bit from the next section. Before shape and form in the chaos of the beginning, the sea cried and descended from the violent dance of fire and stone. It remembers the empty cosmos. It surges to the limits of its container, and by the mists and fogs and rains, it lifts out of its own body, spilling into the margins and past the margins, folding and spilling and othering itself past the edge of itself. The sea extends across the whole of my witnessing, I have sometimes stood at the sea when there was nowhere else to look and have dissolved with my sorrows in its mirrorless gaze. It has eaten my heart. I have tossed my raw meat toward its mouth. It has understood my blood as an offering. I have thrown it my voice and staggered into silence. The the sea is a supreme confidant, one who can witness and withstand our most exquisite agony, can churn it like a simple syrup into the depths, fold our ruinous noises into its endless roaring canto, twinkling and green, and thus consummates our humility. I have never looked at the sea long enough. So that's a little snippet of that. Um, the other thing I, I worked on, and there's a, I did a lot of other things too, like little drawings and sketches and, and paintings. I spent a long time trying to figure out how he made the waves so lifelike, and then I'd go home and try to um, copy from what I remembered, which never worked out, but it was still <laughs> fun to try. Um, but I eventually felt compelled to visit the sea myself, and so I went to Chapman Beach, and I took a little footage of the waves. And I, when I shot it, I was thinking about the composition, you know, the kind of a little bit more sky, which always interested me too, that it's called marine, and yet there's actually more sky than there is ocean, but the power of the ocean makes it the, the more dominant presence. But, but I, I used a similar composition, and um, there's a, it's a greener palette, this painting. I actually ran a picture of the painting through um, like a Benjamin Williams or one of the painting companies. They have a thing where it'll tell you what paint colors are in the painting. And I was surprised to see that they're almost all like khakis and tans. And even that what looked like baby blue to me, when you isolate it, it's more of like this gray, you know, this kind of dull gray color. So when we look at it in context, we see what we're used to. We see green and blue, and, but when you look at it, look at the colors isolated, they're much more earthy than you would expect. But anyway, I, I, I tinted this video with a sort of greenish, it's a totally different green, but with a greenish tint, just um, thinking about this. And I was also thinking about Solaris, which was a novel by Stanislav Lem and later a film by Tarkovsky. But it's a, about this alien planet that has a sentient, a conscious ocean. And the ocean is so advanced that the, the scientists studying it can't comprehend what they're seeing. In fact, it's so complicated that what ends up happening is the ocean is studying them in such a way that 
um, is beyond thinking. It's, it's enacting their dreams. It's pulling things out of their unconscious. Um, it's an alien way of thinking. But it, it's a really strange and, and profound meditation on kind of our, what we don't know about ourselves, the oceans within ourselves. So I'm gonna play the video for you. It's, it's non-narrative, you know, it's an abstract video. It, it's just a single shot of the ocean. And it's, seven, it's uh, like seven and a half minutes long. And I, as you watch, I just want you to think about ob observing. You know, think about how Williams might have looked at the sea. You know, try to really look. Um, there's whispering, too. You'll hear some whispering. And the whispering is actually looped and layered tracks from the chapbook, sort of playing over each other. But I was going for the sort of alien chatter of Solaris. But I, what I want you to do is take some notes as you observe and just sit behind your own thoughts if you can. Try to make kind of a theater of your mind and just observe what you observe. Don't edit. What, don't try to write. Try to just watch yourself watching. You know, notice what you notice. Uh, I like what Allen Ginsberg said, catch yourself thinking. Catch, catch what you're noticing. What are you feeling? Are there stray thoughts? Are there... Um, memories, are there associations that you're having? And don't feel like you have to make it all cohere, like you're writing a poem or something. You might want to try writing in a list form so that you can sort of move from thought to thought. And just let that be an exercise as you listen and watch. Oh, it's a
I love something Rilke said, just keep going, no feeling is final. You know, and a lot of times when I'm writing, it's just moving, trying to move through something and to also let things keep moving through us. But I hope that somewhere in your notes and in your thoughts, there's something that stirred that you might even work on later or keep thinking about. But thank you. We're over time, so just thank you for um, listening and participating. And there's, if you didn't get a booklet or a poem, they're at the back. Um, and there's also, I have some of the little cards in a, some of my little cards in the that little box. And there's a exhibit card too. But thank you so much.